from World News Tonight. New reigns. Japan's new prime minister takes center stage as the country watches on. Pandora panic. Secret wealth and dealings of world leaders exposed. Grim milestone. The world mourns as the pandemic death toll reaches an all-time high. Plastic perfection. Indonesia celebrates a green cause, turning trash into treasure. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Anuradhi Wickramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining with us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage from the new reigns in Japan. Fumio Kishida has formally taken office as Japan's new Prime Minister, succeeding Yoshihide Suga, who resigned after just one year in office. Let's cross over to Other Derana World News Special Correspondent Anjali Vijay Ratna reporting from Fukuoka in Japan for more. Anjali? Yes, I'm ready. Fumio Kishida won the race to lead Japan's ruling Liberal Democratic Party or the LDP last week. He will face a range of tough issues including post-pandemic economic recovery and threats from the North Korea. He will also hope to help his party to regain popularity after its unpopular push to host the Tokyo Olympics. The move to go ahead with the event came despite massive public opposition due to concerns over a surge in COVID cases. Analysts say Kishida is seen as a concerns builder, an establishment choice who represents stability, but the political trend wasn't the popular choice. He had lacklustre support from the public and struggled to shake off his image as a bureaucrat. His first major test will be the next general election in which he will be the face of a party that's been criticized for its handling of the pandemic under Suga. Kishida has promised new capitalism that includes narrowing the income gap and boosting concern spending, consumer spending. He said the economic, economic politics of Abe-san, known as Abenomics, failed to trick down from the rich to poor. He has also proposed a, a hefty recovery package with several tens of trillions of yen to steer Japan's economy out of its pandemic-induced slump. Back to you, Anradi. All right, thank you. That was Other Derana World News Special Correspondent Anjali Vijay Ratna reporting from Fukuoka in Japan. North Korea answered liaison phone calls from the South. The connection comes after a two-month suspension over joint military drills between Seoul and Washington. North Korea restored the severed hotlines with the South on Monday, but it also urged Seoul to step up efforts to improve relations. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un opened the possibility of reactivating the hotlines last week. They had been severed since early August when Pyongyang cut them off in protest against joint U.S.-South Korea military drills. Kim also urged Seoul and Washington to drop their, quote, double standards over weapons development and accused the U.S. of keeping up its hostile policy while also proposing denuclearization talks. North Korea has fired a series of projectiles in recent weeks, including a never-before-seen hypersonic missile and an anti-aircraft missile. Pyongyang maintains that these tests are meant to improve its self-defense just as others do. The launches highlight the isolated country's ongoing development of increasingly sophisticated weapons as denuclearization talks with the U.S. have stalled. The Biden administration has said it has no hostile intent towards North Korea and has called on Pyongyang to resume talks. More than a dozen heads of state and government, including the King of Jordan and the Czech Prime Minister, have amassed millions in secret offshore assets, according to an investigation by the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. It's one of the largest ever global media investigations, involving more than 600 journalists who've analysed some 11.9 million financial documents. The leaked records implicate hundreds of world leaders, politicians, billionaires, celebrities, religious leaders and drug dealers. For the past 25 years, they've been using offshore accounts to hide their investments in luxury properties, yachts and other valuable assets, collectively worth trillions of dollars. The report was released by the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. We have emails, passport copies, bank statements that show how presidents, kings, princesses, billionaires and criminals hide and move money. 
Among the more than 330 current and former politicians identified as beneficiaries of the offshore accounts are Jordan's King Abdullah II, former UK Prime Minister Tony Blair and the Czech Republic's Prime Minister Andrej Babiš, who denied any wrongdoing on Sunday. Many of the secret accounts were designed to evade or avoid taxes. Tony Blair, who has been a vocal critic of tax loopholes, is shown to have been legally avoiding the payment of stamp duty on a multi-million pound property in London. The Pandora Papers are the latest in a series of mass leaks of financial documents, including the 2016 Panama Papers, which led to the resignation of Iceland's leader at the time and set the stage for the ousting of Pakistan's former Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif. Several civilians were killed in a bomb explosion at the entrance of a mosque in Kabul, the deadliest attack in the Afghan capital since the withdrawal of US forces in August. The bomb went off not far from here, on the main road near the entrance of the sprawling Eidgar Mosque in eastern Kabul, where a funeral service was reportedly being held for the mother of Taliban official Zabiullah Mujahid. It's the first major attack in Kabul since the departure of US forces, with a number of people killed and others injured. According to a Taliban spokesperson, three suspects were arrested. In August, 169 Afghans and 13 US servicemen were killed in a terrorist attack at Kabul International Airport. It was claimed by terrorist group Islamic State in Khorasan, a local affiliate of the Islamic State group, which itself maintains a strong presence in the eastern Afghan province of Nangarhar. The group has claimed several attacks on the Taliban, which it considers an enemy. These include recent ones in Nangarhar state capital of Jalalabad and a deadly roadside bomb blast north of Kabul on Friday. Attacks by the Islamic State group and other terrorist organizations could pose a potentially serious threat to stability in the region as Afghanistan emerges from 20 years of war, facing potential economic and social collapse. Crews on the water and on shore worked feverishly to limit environmental damage from one of the largest oil spills in recent California history, caused by a suspected leak in an underwater pipeline that fouled the sands of famed Huntington Beach and could keep the beaches there closed for weeks or longer. It's a race against the clock to save as much wildlife as possible. After more than 572,000 litres of crude oil spilled off the coast of Southern California, the leak coated 33 square kilometres stretching from Huntington Beach to Newport Beach. It's an area that is normally heaving with sunbathers and surfers. Now its shores are covered with dead fish and oil. We are in the midst of a potential ecological disaster here in Huntington Beach. In the coming days and weeks, we challenge the responsible parties to do everything possible to rectify this environmental catastrophe. The oil spill was caused by a pipeline failure connected to the Ellie Oil Ring, a platform run by Beta Offshore, which Amplify Energy Corporation owns. The firm's CEO assures that the pipeline has now been shut off and that the company is working to identify the origin of the leak. We currently have divers on location at the potential source site. Um, we are investigating the source and potential cause of this incident. The breach is being described as one of the largest oil spills in recent Southern Californian history. Back in 2015, more than 378,000 litres of crude leaked off the coast of Santa Barbara. Environmental activists say this latest spill stresses once again the need for the state to switch from fossil fuels to renewable energy. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. Cyclone Shaheen has made landfall in Oman, causing mass havoc as authorities warn of the severity of the worsening conditions caused by strong gusts of wind and torrents. The cyclone has already caused multiple deaths. Tropical Cyclone Shaheen bore down on Oman on Sunday, killing at least three people. It prompted authorities to delay flights to and from the capital Muscat and urge residents to evacuate coastal areas. One child who had been swept away by water was found dead, the state news agency said, and at least one other person was missing. Two workers were killed when a hill collapsed on their housing area in an industrial zone as a result of the cyclone, the state news agency also reported. 
Video footage from local broadcasters showed vehicles submerged as people tried to make their way through the muddy brown flood water. The eye of the storm was about 40 miles from the capital and it was carrying top winds of 75 miles per hour or more, according to a joint statement by the country's hazard weather and civil aviation agencies. The storm's centre was expected to hit land during the late afternoon and evening. With it will come very high winds and heavy rainfall, though the outer bands of the system were already being felt. More than 2,700 people were put in emergency shelters. Most of the country's 5 million people live in and around Muscat. Authorities said roads in the capital would be open only to vehicles on emergency and humanitarian journeys until the storm dies down. Now on to the updates of the COVID crisis. A new grim milestone has been reached recently as 5 billion people have now lost their lives to the deadly pandemic, with most of the deaths mounting to the unvaccinated population. Worldwide deaths related to COVID-19 surpassed 5 million on Friday, with unvaccinated people particularly exposed to the dangerous Delta strain. More than half of all global deaths reported on a seven-day average were in the United States, Russia, Brazil, Mexico, and India. While it took just over a year for the COVID-19 death toll to hit 2.5 million, the next 2.5 million deaths were recorded in just under eight months. There has been increasing focus in recent days on getting vaccines to poorer nations, where many people are yet to receive a first dose, even as their richer counterparts have begun giving booster shots. The United States, which has been battling vaccine misinformation, surpassed 700,000 deaths on Friday the highest toll of any country. As a region, South America has the highest death toll in the world, accounting for 21 percent of all reported deaths, followed by North America and Eastern Europe. However, India, one of the first countries ravaged by the Delta variant, has gone from an average of 4,000 deaths a day to less than 300 as its vaccination campaign is rolled out. The Delta variant is now the dominant strain across the globe and has been reported in 187 out of 194 World Health Organization member countries. New Zealand has gone behind closed doors yet again as fresh outbreaks of the Delta variant of the pandemic has caused larger clusters of cases, threatening the country's COVID-free reign. New Zealand's Delta variant outbreak has spread beyond the largest city of Auckland, prompting Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern on Sunday to put more regions in lockdown. Auckland has been in lockdown since mid-August in what was meant to be a short and sharp nationwide lockdown. While the rest of the country has largely returned to normal life, the North Island city has remained in lockdown for almost two months. Arden called on citizens to get vaccinated to avoid more restrictions in the future. The people of Auckland are sacrificing a lot to do that too. But they are doing that to give everyone else time to be vaccinated. If, in the meantime, the virus moves beyond the Auckland boundary and the places it moves to have low vaccination rates, then today is an example of how we will need to respond. On Saturday, protesters took to the streets to rally against the lockdown in Auckland, which Arden called a slap in the face. 32 new coronavirus cases were recorded on Sunday and two cases in the Waikato region south of Auckland. Parts of the region will go into a five-day lockdown. She added that full vaccination will become a requirement for non-New Zealand citizens arriving in the country from November 1st. We have some good news for you. Schools reopened in India's western Maharashtra state today after being shut for over one year due to the coronavirus pandemic. Students were welcomed with flowers and sweets at a school in Pune city as they arrived to attend classes after a long period. Men dressed as clowns were also present at the entry gate to encourage the students. In Mumbai city, students underwent thermal scanning, sanitization and were asked to practice social distancing to prevent the spread of the coronavirus. India, in March last year, had ordered the closure of schools, colleges and other educational institutions and pushed for classes to move online to curb the spread of the deadly virus. But with the COVID-19 cases declining, schools and colleges were reopened amid declining cases. 
Southern Kerala state also reopened colleges even amid a daily tally of over 12,000 cases. With the U.S. COVID-19 death toll now surpassing 700,000, the highest of any country, the federal government is leaning on vaccine mandates by individual states and businesses to help stop the spread. However, some local leaders are resisting the efforts. Tomorrow, one of the strictest vaccine mandates in the country goes into effect. Connecticut demanding all state workers get vaccinated, commit to weekly testing, or face suspension. I'm concerned about uh, making sure we're well prepared if uh, there is an another Delta. I'm really concerned about making sure I keep our schools open and our economy going. The governor now preparing the National Guard to step in if necessary. The state's health commissioner hoping that won't be the case. We are looking at really having so many of our people vaccinated that that will not be necessary. But at this point, things are still being tabulated. In New York City, fears of a staffing shortage in the largest school district in America. All teachers must be vaccinated tomorrow, no testing option. Some 10,000 employees may not be allowed to work. The mayor says substitutes are standing by and that most teachers are vaccinated. A 93% of our teachers, 98% of our principals, the bottom line is this mandate has worked. Teacher Nicole Broker won't be showing up tomorrow. Now you're taking away their teachers, their powers, their, their go-to person. She says she had asymptomatic COVID in the spring of last year. I've had many doctors say to me, you don't need it right now. You know, maybe in the future. And while the White House COVID-19 data director says today saw the highest reported increase of vaccinations in a month, the nation's top doctor says it's too soon to tell whether we can gather for the holidays. We've just got to concentrating on continuing to get those numbers down and not try yeah. to jump ahead by weeks or months and say what we're going to do at a particular time. Welcome back. And for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. At least eight people were killed in northern India after clashes broke out at a farmers' protest in deadly escalation of their year-long campaign against controversial agriculture laws. Red-hot lava spewed into the air from La Palma's volcano as the eruption gathered force following the collapse of Cumbre Veja's north side. The collapse caused a faster flow of lava. Dubai opened doors to its World Fair Expo 2020, which had been delayed by a year due to the pandemic. The United Arab Emirates has poured more than $7 billion into the event, hoping to attract tourism and investments. President Rodrigo Duterte announced his retirement from politics. He vowed to withdraw from the next election as the overwhelming sentiment of the Filipinos is that he is not qualified. American scientist David Julius and Arden Patipushan won the 2021 Nobel Prize for Medicine for discoveries of receptors of temperature and touch that could pave the way for new painkillers. Unprecedented torrential rains battered northeast China's Liaoning province, causing severe waterlogging in the streets and residential areas, inundating roads, trapping dwellers and leading to traffic disruptions. And finally tonight, environmentalists in Indonesia are keen to send a message about the world's worsening ocean plastics crisis and have created a museum made entirely from plastics to convince people to rethink their habits and say no to single-use bags and bottles. The outdoor exhibition in the town of Grizik in East Java took three months to assemble and is made up of more than 10,000 plastic waste items, from bottles and bags to sachets and straws, all collected from polluted rivers and beaches. The centerpiece is a statue called Devi Shri, a goddess of prosperity widely worshipped by the Javanese. Her long skirt is made from single-use sachets of household items. The plastics problem is particularly acute in Indonesia, an archipelago nation that ranks second only behind China for its volume of plastics that end up in the seas. Together with the Philippines and Vietnam, the four countries are responsible for more than half of the ocean plastics, and Indonesian efforts to regulate use of plastic packaging has had mixed results. The exhibition has received more than 400 visitors since it opened early last month. The museum has become a popular location for selfies shared widely on social media where visitors pose against a background of thousands of suspended water bottles. 
And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Suzanne Chanel will join you again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Anradhi Vikramasinghe. Until then, stay safe and have a great night.